Why would I need to learn about problem solving? I solve problems every day. I'm, I'm a manager. I'm an executive. I'm a human being. And you know, all of us deal with problems every day and solve problems every day. And especially the most skilled and the most successful of us like to think and like to believe that we're pretty good at doing that. So I thought I'd start with a story. And the story is the story of uh, this picture that you see here, which is the day that the CEO of Danone at the time, Franck Ribou, you see on the left, and Mohamed Yunus, who was the next year going to be the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, got together to uh, sign a deal that was a joint venture between Danone and Grameen, aimed at uh, providing special foods to children in Bangladesh to fight malnutrition in Bangladesh. And the, the idea came out of a lunch that Franck Ribou and Mohamed Yunus had together in 2005, where they basically thought, you, Mohamed, you have Grameen in Bangladesh, which has a fantastic distribution network that can reach to uh, people who normally don't have access to sophisticated foods, we, Danone, we are a great food company and we're especially good at making yogurt. So why don't we make a special yogurt that's going to be fortified with vitamins, that's going to be designed specially for young children who need those special vitamins to grow up to be healthy kids? And we're going to call it Shokti Doi, which means healthy kid, I think, in uh, Bengali. Um, and uh, we're going to market it and it's going to be a great social enterprise. Now, that sounds like a great idea, but when I ask my MBA students, for instance, what could possibly go wrong with this plan, it usually takes about 30 seconds for them to tell me, well, we can see a couple of things that could go wrong with this plan. We can see that refrigerator distribution might be a problem in Bangladesh. We can see that the price of a product like this, which is a sophisticated uh, you know, product might be a problem for this particular part of the population. We can see that maybe it's not actually a product that fits their need very well. Maybe it's not something they actually like. It's not something that they are used to. And maybe they are going to perceive this as an alien product and not what they need. And in fact, it turns out that these were exactly the reasons why this joint venture turned out not to be a great success and certainly not to meet the high expectations that they had when they signed this deal. And by the way, you can see, I haven't mentioned him, but you have probably recognized Zinedine Zidane, uh, who is standing in the middle of the picture for no reason that I can personally explain. I think he's just here for the publicity. So basically, these two extremely smart people came up with a plan that most of us in 30 seconds can tell has a big bug. How does that happen? How can a company like Danone and a company like Grameen and two extraordinarily talented people like Ribou and Yunus come up with a plan that strikes us all as being half-baked, to put it mildly? Well, that's what happens when we think we solve problems by coming up with an idea and asking, is this a good plan? Of course, it's a good question to ask. We have an idea, is it a good plan? They could have said, well, actually, there's a few problems with that. But when we fall in love with our ideas, we tend to think that if there are obstacles, and yes, of course, they realize that there was a problem with refrigerated distribution, for instance, but obstacles are here to be overcome. So if you are at the head of a big organization like Franck at that time, you go to your people and you say, you're in charge of this plan, overcome those obstacles. And everybody is fascinated by this plan because obviously it's a great opportunity and it is going to do a lot of good in addition to hopefully being um, a viable business. And so everybody gets excited about it and it takes years before we end up seeing the problem. Sadly, a large number of decisions fit this model. In fact, one study showed that 70% of business Yes or no. So we tend to start by formulating ideas, looking for reasons why the ideas would work, looking for ways to overcome the possible barriers to making those ideas work, and we think that's good. 
it's not so good. It's a problem. It's not a great way to solve problems. So, of course, the next step is to spectrum. That's why just look at one plan. Let's try to have a number of options. And that's what we all try to do when we're trying to do better than, uh, uh, than, uh, than have one simple option. Um, when we do that, it's a little bit better, but we still run into some problems. And here I'm going to share another story to try to illustrate the problem. The story is the story of the music industry at the turn of the millennium facing the threat of MP3. Now, you can all remember what the threat of MP3 looked like. Basically, it was an ugly screen like this on your desktop where people, mostly students in their university dorms, would download files and share them through peer-to-peer -peer systems. And of course, the most famous of the peer-to-peer -peer systems was Napster. What did the record industry do? They all got together and 14 record companies joined forces to say, well, we know what's going on. This is piracy. We need to stop this piracy. This is the same sort of piracy that happened when people were making bootleg CDs and selling them on the night markets of Asia. This is the same piracy that was happening back in the 1970s when people were making tapes and selling the tapes. It's just a different medium, but basically it's good old piracy. Let's sue these people. And so those 14 companies get together they sue Napster, and less than a year later, they actually get a verdict that forces Napster to shut down, and they declare victory. Now, they have looked at a number of options. They have said, what could we do? They decided that the best option was to sue Napster. And, of course, as we all know, that didn't solve their problem, because the problem wasn't Napster. The problem was that music was going digital. So when these guys hadn't figured out was that having options is not good enough if you haven't figured out what is the problem you're trying to solve. What they should have asked in that particular case is, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, the problem they should have been trying to solve is the problem of how do we make money in a world where music is going digital? It's not a problem of stopping Napster. It's not a problem of stopping another platform which would then appear. It's a problem of realizing that there is a fundamental shift in the industry and solving that problem. How do we make money in a world where music is digital? When you have actually posed the problem in those ways, you have taken the first step in what my co-authors and I here call the 4S method to solve a complex problem. It starts with stating the problem. Here we have stated the problem of the, MP of the record companies. Then we, you would have to structure the problem, you would have to solve it, and you would have to sell it. The pitfall that a lot of people run into, and that we just saw in those two examples, is to think that you can start by solving the problem and by selling the solution. And sometimes you can sell the solution very convincingly without having properly posed to state the problem and to define what it is that you're trying to solve. And that is not something that we do naturally. That is something that we need to learn. When we learn to do this, we learn a lot of things, but one of the things that we learn is that a good way to ask this question or a good sub-question of the question, what is the problem or what is the problem we're trying to solve, is this question. And this question looks like nothing, but it's incredibly powerful. What will success look like? What will success look like? Have solved the problem. If, for instance, you define the problem of is in Bangladesh. How would you say you could say thing to solve the problem of how to feed children what they need in Bangladesh in great numbers and to deliver the right vitamins to them and so on? How, how will we know look like well, kids suffering from malnutrition in Bangladesh? Now, when you pose the problem in that way, if they had posed the problem in that way, what would they have done? Well, to see the difference, we can turn to the way the same problem has been tackled by other players in other countries. Look, for instance, at a company called Nutrizaza, which is a social business you may not have heard about, based in Madagascar, which has basically tackled the same problem. 
how do we solve the problem of malnutrition in children in Madagascar? And what you see here is something called Cobaina, uh, which is a local uh, high nutrition uh, in, uh, ingredient based on corn, rice, soybean, and salt, to which you just add a few vitamins. It costs about five cents in euro cents per serving. And it's about five to 10 times cheaper than the alternatives. What you also see is that these guys, Nutrizaza, have figured out that one of the big barriers to getting this distributed was that if you rely on the normal distribution system, it's not going to get to the mothers at the time they need to prepare the food. So they actually created those restaurants for babies, which you see here, which are, uh, which are the little buildings you see here, where basically the mothers get fully prepared foods and nutritional advice. These guys are aiming to serve 40 million meals in uh, 2020 in uh, Madagascar. And the same model with variations has been implanted in lots of other countries by similar companies. It's an example of what happens when you start by asking the problem in the right way, by stating the right problem, not jumping to the solution that happens to be available to you because that's what you know how to do. On the other example that I mentioned, what would have success looked like for the record companies? How should they have stated the problem? Well, if they had stated the problem as how do we make money with digital music, they might have come up with something like this. When Apple asked the question, how do we make money in a world of digital music, Apple came up with the iPod. We tend to forget it now because the iPhone, of course, has supplanted the iPod. But at the peak of its sales in 2007, the iPod was selling 50 million units a year and was accounting for 40% of Apple revenues. The iPod, not the iPhone, which was launched in 2007, late 2007, was the main engine of the revival of Apple and was actually the platform on which the success of the iPhone was built. Without the iPod, there probably would have been no iPhone. So by stating the same problem that the record companies failed to state in a correct way, Apple was able to build what is today the most valuable company in the world. I hope these examples illustrate the fact that this skill, this ability to state the right problem, and then, of course, to proceed to structure, solve, and sell the solution to the problem, I hope these example illustrate that it's a vital skill, that it's an absolutely essential skill. If you still doubt it, let me give you a couple more facts. When you ask uh, executives what are the most important skills that you're looking for in the people you hire, and speci especially the most important leadership skills, you would expect them to tell you that it's about inspiring and motivating others, and in fact, they do say that. You might expect them to tell you that it's about having a strategic perspective, and they say that, but it's towards the bottom. You might expect them to tell you that it's about driving for results, and yes, it's there. But one of the most important things on the list, and actually quite close to the top, is solving problems, being able to solve complex problems, because you're not a leader if you don't solve problems. For another example, which... Um, ask the same question in a different way. Here, the economist asked um, uh, companies, what are the most, recruiters in fact, what are the most critical skills for employees in your organization to possess? What are the most important skills that you recruit for? Stunningly, problem solving is by far the most important skill at the top. So all these people are telling you problem solving is very important. And what is more, and this is quite striking, everybody expects that problem solving is going to become not less important, but more important. You might think that because of artificial intelligence, for instance, problem solving skills are going to become less important because the, the ability of machines to come up with solutions is going to somehow replace or at least supplement our own ability to come up with solutions to problems. But in fact, when you ask experts what they think about this, at least 70% of them expect the importance of problem-solving skills to increase in the next three years. The reason is simple. 
Machines, artificial intelligence among others, are not able to state problems. They're able to solve a problem that has been well posed. And sometimes they do that very well, especially when it's a repetitive problem. But why is human intelligence that has been trained to do this? How could you be trained to do this? professional training kids that exist that, oddly enough, are not very widely taught, but that are teachable. One skill set, one approach, is, let's call it analytical problem solving. It's the way of solving problem that goes back to Aristotle, where you take a complicated problem, you break it into pieces, and you solve the pieces one by one, put it back together. That is Aristotle, that is Descartes, and that is basically the way that strategy consulting firms teach their people to solve problems. When you hire a strategy consultant because you think they're going to solve your problem, what you're really hiring is their ability to apply a problem-solving method that they have honed and taught their people over the years. It's basically analytical problem-solving. Now, You've probably heard people say that consultants are fine for routine problems, but that they're not very creative. That is true if that is the only part of the toolkit that they have. That's why the other toolkit, which is different and complementary, is what we might call integrative problem solving or the toolkit of design thinking. This comes from the creatives, from the world of design agencies and advertising agencies, and it has been developed over the years to be more and more applicable to anything that is a business problem with a human component, any marketing problem, any product design problem, any behavioral change problem lends itself well to being tackled with this sort of problem-solving approach with an integrative problem-solving approach inspired by design thinking. These two toolkits are often opposed, and especially by the design thinkers who like to say that they have the only approach that solves the really complicated problems, the ones that require creativity and integrative problem solving. And this is true. Uh, it is appropriate to problems that analytical problem solving doesn't solve, but that doesn't mean that it solves all problems. Basically, you need both. You need to know these two toolkits, and you need to know when to apply which, and you need to know that if you have learned both, you will be in a better place than if you haven't. The main idea I wanted to leave you with today is that problem solving is not only a vital skill, which I hope these examples have shown, it is actually a teachable skill. And as a teacher, as a professor who teaches those skills, my experience has been that in a few hours of teaching those skills, you can make a great difference. Of course, you don't turn everyone instantly into a fabulous problem solver, but you can make a great difference and help a lot of executives, of MBA students, of executive MBA students who have a lot of problems to solve and who will benefit from this training to avoid some of the big mistakes and to be much more proficient at stating, structuring, solving problems and selling their solutions. 